As you know, I recently left my corporate job and I've been in total recovery mode all about self-care. One of my new routines is the nighttime shower before bed. There's just something about washing away the day and that reflection that's been super helpful for me. I've been using one of our partners, Osea's Mega Moisture Duo. This combo body oil and body lotion are so freaking incredible. It literally feels like I'm at a spa. I realize that the secret is seaweed and other skin level ingredients that are normally reserved for face products. And that's why I was so excited when Osea became one of our partners. And, you know, we're so grateful for partners like this because one, they keep the show going, but they're also super good for all of our listeners and for our own well-being. So if you want to have that nighttime bliss like I am doing, you can get 10% off your first order site-wide with code DATABLE at OseaMalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over for $60. So head to OSEAMalibu.com and use the code DATABLE for 10% off. Let us know which products you end up going with. Share them in social. Super excited to see what you end up choosing. I was so excited to get my shipment from Last Bottle Wines in the mail the other day full of incredible red wines all from Napa Valley. I love wine tasting, so having this to my door couldn't be happier. Also couldn't be more excited that today's episode is brought to you by Last Bottle Wines. If you don't know already, they're a Napa-based online wine shop with a twist. They offer just one hand-picked wine per day until it sells out, and they're always at incredible prices. We're talking 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part is that there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase. And I could not be more excited to bring this offer right now because they're having a marathon sale, which is coming up March 28th and 29th. Even better, we're offering Datable listeners 10% off your first order with code Datable. So if you are a wine lover like me, this is a great time to join. And did I mention that shipping is 100% free? So so what are you waiting for? Mark your calendar for March 28th and 29th or get on it earlier if you want. You can sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use code DATABLE and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. The Datable podcast features real stories from real people of how they make modern dating work or not. I'm your host, Yue, former dating coach turned dating insider, if you will. On each episode, you'll hear commentary from my producer, Julie Kraftchik, and other surprise co-hosts. This episode of Datable is brought to you by 500 Brunches. 500 Brunches connects like-minded people with similar interests to meet in real life over brunch. You answer a quick questionnaire about your interests and how you spend your time, and then they'll match you in small groups of six to eight at a brunch spot in San Francisco. Get a free entry into a brunch now by signing up at 500brunches.com and using the code DATEABLE. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Dateable, a show all about modern dating. Have you ever been curious about the sex industry? What is it like to be a professional sex worker? Well, we have Emily here with us today, and she is a professional dominatrix. She has been in the Bay Area for 18 years, originally from London. She's 44 years old, polyamorous, trans woman, queer, kink positive, and sex positive. So basically, everything we want to know, <laughs> we, we can ask all the questions right now. Emily, how are you? I'm great. Thank you. We're going to give you kind of like a generic online definition of what a, what a dominatrix is, mm -hmm. and we love to hear what you think of it okay. and what, <laughs> what we can amend to okay, it. Okay, right. Ahead. So a dominatrix is a woman who takes a dominant role in BDSM activities might be an, in any sexual orientation, but her orientation does not necessarily limit the genders of her submissive partners. The role of a dominatrix may not even involve physical pain toward the submissive. Her domination can be verbal, involving humiliating tasks or servitude. A dominatrix is typically a paid professional, as the term dominatrix is little used within the non-professional BDSM scene. Yeah, <laughs> what do you think? Okay. The only thing I might, a small footnote here, is I think I do know people in the non-professional scene who would describe themselves as a dom yeah. or a dominatrix. Mm, okay. It's more about the role Got than it. being paid or not paid. 
So then you would say I'm either a pro dom or non pro dom. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Is the Got only it. difference payment? Pretty much. Yes. Okay. So tell us a little bit about about yourself. <laughs> you moved here 18 years ago. Right. When did you get into this industry? Um, only professionally about five years ago. Okay. When I first arrived in the Bay Area, it was only going to be on a one year assignment, but I just loved it here, and particularly because on one year assignment doing. I was in the software industry. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm a techie geek. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the right place yeah. then. <laughs> in fact, the first year or two I was here, it was the, the dot-com crash in oh, 2000. Okay. So I never used to say what I did because I was the problem. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. Anyway. And then when I got here, I just stumbled across this ever-expanding network. People who were kink positive, people who were sex positive, people who were BDSM. Even back then, huh? Oh, yeah. Those kind of strands, if you like, have been in the Bay Area since at least the 50s. Do you think it's just become more public recently? Yeah, that's all that's changed, really. Right. You know, the community's always always been there. Mm -hmm. And part of it is the internet. You know, mm -hmm. like prior to the internet, you had to get you know, a, a street paper and it would be in the back pages. Right. <laughs> so it's not so visible. Right. Right. Anyway, I started discovering all these various communities and I was like, wow, this is great. In fact, I thought, wow, this is me. Uh-huh. You know, there was I nothing like this in London? Not so much. I think the issue is that in London, it's a huge city. There's like 10 mm -hmm. to 20 million people, depending how you count it. And there is a queer or, a, you know, a BDSM community, mm -hmm. but they exist in little silos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear like New York is like that too. Yeah. yeah. It's very siloed. It's segregated. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you don't know about that community, you'll never hear exactly. about it. But here in San Francisco, if it's way more in your face. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but I also think it is who you know here too, because I think for years, like I wasn't over, like exposed to it, mm -hmm. and I know friends of mine weren't either. Yeah. So I think podcasts like this and other ways mm -hmm. to like make it more just out in the open is really yeah, interesting. Yeah, I started meeting people like um, one uh, group of people I met very early on was Mission Control. Do you know them? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Oh well, your <laughs> viewers or listeners may Educate be interested us. in checking them out. <laughs> it's called Mission Control. Okay. And they run a series of different themed parties. Okay. Which are not professional. You just have to turn up. Uh, they used to be in the city, but they couldn't afford the rent. And mm. now they're in East Bay. Typical. Right. So I started <laughs> meeting people and then people would invite me to a, a public party. Mm. You know, not that much happens really. But through that, I got to meet people who invited me to private parties. Mm. You know, and so, so I started... Yeah. expanding these overlapping circles. So what made you go from like party goer to being in the industry? Um, so two things. One is I, I've been working in the software industry and, you know, I really didn't want to do that anymore. I stopped doing that and I was thinking, well, you know, maybe I can, I'm very interested in this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can earn some money doing this. And how do you start working professionally, getting paid for doing this? Um, I think lots of people just set themselves up. I mean, in my case, I actually went on a course. There's a, there's a the, course? Oh, yes. There's a <laughs> place in the city called the Academy of s &M Arts. Oh, my gosh. Okay. That's yeah. amazing. And they teach intensives, not just for professional um, people, but also for people who are just interested in becoming more expert in BDSM. Mm. So you go on a three-day intensive, and then after that... I created a website and I put ads up and I started getting inquiries. And when you say you put ads up, you mean printed out ads all over the oh, city no. or? This is online. Okay. There are various sites. So do you use like Google AdWords or? <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately, I mean, what's happened over the years is repeated government legislation, which mm. is trying to drive sex work off the internet. And so a lot of the main advertising sites, I used to advertise on Backpage, for example, mm -hmm. but they got shut down. Mm. I used to advertise on Craigslist, mm -hmm. but they voluntarily closed their personals. Um, so now I advertise on a site which is actually based in Switzerland because therefore out of the reach of the feds, but uh. it's visible in the US and it's called Eros. Oh. How do you spell it? E-R-O-S, as in e Eros for God of Love. Oh. Oh. What about FetLife? Is there... I'm on FetLife too. Okay, yeah. so that's one that's... That's more kind of just having a presence in the community. I don't mm -hmm. really get much work that way. And then what is it? So when you put an ad up, how are you describing your services? What are you um, offering? Depends where your ad is. Um, and I think different DOMs tend to uh, describe themselves differently. You know, one of the tricks is to really get a feel for who you are. And therefore, you may turn off some potential clients. You're not what they're looking for, but you will find clients who are mm -hmm. 
looking for just you. So I play up the British act oh, side yeah. of things. <laughs> As you should. I play up the strict commanding yes. governess. Okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm often very quiet and nice, though, but I can certainly draw myself up and sound the part. Uh, quite, yeah. you know, button up and, Indeed. you know. yeah. So I guess my question is, like, what types of clients do you have? Like, who is drawn to this? What are some of the reasons they're drawn mm. to it? Well, I actually make it a practice of rare. I don't ask my clients too many questions. Mm-hmm. because I really get the impression a great many of them, well, virtually all my clients are cis men. Most of them tend to be a little bit older because it's to do with finances. You know, younger mm-hmm. guys don't tend to have my fee. I also get the impression many of them in relationships and this is how they express a part of themselves that they don't feel confident about expressing within their relationship. Do you think that their significant others, if they're in relationships, know about this? Or is this a secret? I don't ask too much. Occasionally, I, you know, with a, a regular client, I get to know a little bit more what they're willing to volunteer. Right. And in some cases, they do say that the partner, the significant other, has an idea, but they're very much in don't ask, don't tell mode. And what are your most requested services? For me, specifically, mm-hmm. it falls into two main categories. There's okay. one, which is, if you like, standard BDSM. You know, they want to be tied up, flogged, tortured in some way. I have a preference for using just using my hands. Okay. So, you know, you can do an awful lot. If you're just your nails and soft, tender parts of people's anatomy. Oh. Define flogged again. Well, there's there's things called floggers, Uh which are like, you know, they have these leather pieces and you hang somewhere across, usually across the bum. Mm, Well, okay. (laughs) Um, Sometimes you might use a paddle and different people prefer different levels of intensity. Mm. And do you establish that from the very beginning? Is there like a really long... I try, Consultation? <laughs> I try to get some idea of what their interests are. I find that a lot of my clients are not very good at expressing what they're interested in uh, or they're, they're a little scared to express what they're interested in. Mm-hmm. So they, they tend to give me very vague ideas. Mm. And then I have to kind of, na- with a new client, a lot of the first session is navigating, trying to figure out oh what's gosh. working for them, what's not working for them. Isn't that just dating in general? <laughs> Nobody knows it what is. they're really looking for. Yeah. Well, the good thing about BDSM is if you're properly trained, mm-hmm. you have all these little tricks. Oh. So, for example, if I have got someone tied up, I will ask them, is that too tight? Now, uh-huh. that's a very considerate dom right there. <laughs> it's important because everybody's so different. Um, if I'm spanking somebody... Mm-hmm. I will ask them after a few strokes, I will say, on a scale of one to ten, where is that? You're just asking for feedback. Yeah. That's great. Which is actually a good (laughs) idea when you're dating too. Yeah, seriously. So we had um, another guest before Mm -hmm. that was into rope bondage, Mm -hmm. and she talked about how it wasn't always a sexual thing. Right. What do you see with your clients? I think some of my clients are interested in rope, but the vast majority, it's definitely sexual. You said there are two main services, BDSM and the second one. Uh The other one is sissies. Sissies. People who like to cross-dress or cross-dressers often call themselves that, or they're interested in forced feminization, although in my experience, they don't need much forcing. Uh, And you (laughs) said these are mostly straight men that are coming? No, I say that the cis men, male-bodied people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether they're straight or not, I mean, I don't think that's a very helpful definition here. If they like wearing feminine attire yep. once every month or so, and perhaps more, and they like being with a, a trans woman mm-hmm. who's in charge, mm-hmm. does that make them straight or gay or who knows? This reminds me, so the first exposure I had to a pro-dominatrix was in college. Mm-hmm. One of my majors was sociology, and she came um, as a guest speaker for one of our courses, and she said most of the men who come come to her who cross-dress with her will repeatedly say, I'm a straight male. I'm a straight male. Mm-hmm. I only I do this. I only <laughs> do this with you. I'm mm-hmm. a straight male. Indeed. Do you find that as oh, well? Oh, absolutely. I think it's um, part of male socialization mm. is they struggle against, you know, all the way through school, little boys call other little boys queer. All right. They don't use that word. They say you're a homo. If you socialized as male, you grow up in this ticky little box. Yes. Any you know, interest in bright clothing, you're, you're gay. All these guys, they they're very interested in seeing someone like me, mm-hmm. but and they're very interested in my body, mm. but but they're definitely straight. Oh yeah, and they'll keep <laughs> reassuring you that. Well, yeah. they don't because I I don't like to hear it. I tell them to shut up. Oh good, <laughs> and they're like that. They're like yes, keep telling me but to shut up. 
yeah, I, I just think it gets in the way. Yeah. I'm having to constantly reassure them. I just say, well, you're, you're definitely straight. Mm -hmm. And shut up. Let's move on. Let's yeah. move on. So, so they say, where yes, does the sex come in? Yeah. Oh, no. Where the, where the well, sexual activities happen. I think when you did your definition, it doesn't necessarily involve sexual contact. Mm -hmm. But in my particular niche, that is what they're interested in. They're Got very it. interested in the fact that I'm a woman, but mm -hmm. in some respects, I have male parts because they probably played with cis women who are dominatrixes who might use a strap on and they like being submissive and being taken. And then they, they're very interested in being taken by me. And that's usually sex. We're talking about yes. penetration. It depends. Not everybody, but oh. most. Back to the pro dom that I had met, mm -hmm. you know, years ago. She said she would do these sort of like surveys at the end of her services and ask, why did you come to me? What am I fulfilling mm -hmm. for you? And a lot of her clients were C-level executives who said, I'm so sick of making all the decisions at work. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be somewhere where someone else is making decisions Absolutely. for me and tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the main reasons why people come to you? I think they're very varied. I mean, I do have that subset of clients, people who I either know or strongly suspect of quite senior in organizations. They have that certain power, you know, the way they stand and sit. Yeah. But they, they do just want to give in. And then I have another set of clients who are, it's kind of a bucket list item. They've seen the fan, all the things on uh -huh. the internet yeah. and they're like, wow, that's so hot. I'd like to try <laughs> that. And then some of them only do it once, you know, and I yep. don't see them ever again. They've ticked it off their bucket list, which and is so fine. With all those, because there's a huge range, mm -hmm. which one is more common for you? The one, one offers or... The regular clients that come consistently. 50 50, I'd say. Oh, you know, okay. So I have this core of regular clients, some of whom I've seen for years, and then there's people who just come and go. Are there any other like commonalities between like race and age or anything like that? Well, the majority are Caucasian, mostly 40 plus. The more likely to be able to squirrel away, it's all cash because mm -hmm. they don't want it to be traced. Right. So you have to be earning a reasonable amount to be able to squirrel away three, you know, three hundred dollars, right. which is my hourly fee. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Yeah. You mind <laughs> yeah. sharing that? Three hundred so. an hour, and where does this take place? A, a variety of places. There actually are dungeons in the Bay Area. There's mm -hmm. one, two in San Francisco, two in Oakland that I know of, which you can rent by the hour. Like a co-working space. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Like Except usually, usually you're the only space. person there. There's a shared calendar. You get the... yeah. I like how you said usually. Sometimes there may be overlap. Well, yeah, if you get overlap, it usually freaks the clients out. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I feel Imagine. like I'm not anonymous anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it could be in a, a designated dungeon space mm -hmm. or it could be at the home could that happen? not at their homes no. never okay i don't think i've ever been to a client's home mm. there is a, a house that i use in the city a friend's house mm. okay which is more of a residential house for some of my clients like a lot of the quote sissies uh -huh. don't need specialized equipment you know so we don't need i don't need to hire a place i can just borrow a friend's house can you quickly give us a list of all the equipment you have I have only a smallish amount. Oh, yeah? Okay. The, the equipment I have is mostly I can carry in a tote bag. People visiting the city, they'll be in a hotel downtown. I wear my business casual. I walk in with my tote bag. And I have, you know, a nice paddle, a nice flogger, some restraints, uh, a blindfold, a ball gag. Mm. But it's all fits in my little, my quite large tote bag. And do you get requests for certain... Oh, yes. I actually prefer clients who just give me on my website. Um, can I mention the website? Yes, yeah, please, please do. do. <laughs> so my prof full professional name is Ms. Emily Oxford. Uh -huh. And the website is MS for Ms. Uh -huh. Emily, E-M-I-L-I-E. Oxford, O-X-F-O-R-D dot com. And, and we'll, we'll link this in the show notes yeah, as well. Thank you. And on there, there's one page which says my interests include. And so I give a list of things that... And I say, this is not exhaustive. If you're interested in something else, do let me know. So some clients will say, oh, I'm very interested in like four or five out of my list. And I like that because that gives a lot of room to play. Mm. You know, it's, more, it's like jazz. You yeah. can see how the session's going and riff on what's happening. Other clients have a very specific script, a particular fantasy 
which they describe in advance. And that's what I provide. That's part of my service. I will make your fantasies come true. But it's not as much fun for me. (laughs) (laughs) So Emily gave us her card earlier and it says, at my service. I love that as a tagline. (laughs) At my service. So you know how like people go to Bangkok for certain like sexual Mm -hmm. acts. Do you feel like you get a lot of people from out of town and travelers like coming to San Francisco? Oh, definitely. Yes. Okay, because I know you mentioned it's, hotels were somewhere right. you went. So it's not like vast majority of my clients, but there are people who email me and say, oh, I've been checking out your website or your ad for years. Mm. I'm finally coming to San Francisco. Oh, wow. So it's I like, can see that. I can yeah. totally see that. Because, you know, San Francisco has that reputation. And yeah, as far as exactly. I know, there aren't many trans doms even in San Francisco Never mind the rest of the country. Right. So People are certainly not going to Kansas looking for that. <laughs> Although that could be pretty hot. Yeah, if you found one. If you found one. Do you get clients that come, I'm sure you do, who walk away saying, that wasn't what I expected? I think so, yeah. I'm sure that happens. The way I like to work is to have a reasonable level of connection. It makes the experience better for both of us. And sometimes you just don't get much of a connection with a client. So how do you filter for that? Do you call them ahead of time? I like to talk to a client in advance. Your own safety. That's what I was wondering. I do, taking a step or two back, when I get an initial inquiry from a new client, my preference, my requirement is that I get a reference from a, a previous person that they've seen who can I I can then call up make sure they're legit yeah. if they don't have a reference which is true sometimes mm-hmm. I require them to ever give me work ID which of course not many people are interested in yeah. or we have an introductory visit over coffee in a public setting in a very public okay. setting okay just smart. to like feel yeah. them out and yeah. make sure you don't get any but vibes but my, my experience over the years has been that if people are willing to go through that process they're almost always okay absolutely right. we should do that with online dating yeah. can I see a copy of my work ID <laughs> before I meet up with you Thank you very much. So back to your personal life, like how has this impacted your own dating and relationships? I don't want to generalize from this because I'm sure everybody's experience is going to be very different. I'm in two long-term relationships, which predate doing this professionally. So my situation is I have two main partners. One I've been with for 15 years. Oh, wow. Wow. So shortly after you moved to San Francisco. Yeah. So you guys were... 10 years, both of whom I met through the sex positive community, their sole concern is safety, which might mean physical safety and, you know, safety, safe sex. And also when you meet them, you're already meeting them in a context of this community. So there's not much explaining for you to do. So, And what are your work hours like? I've got incredibly flexible work hours. Yeah. Yeah. I see a lot of clients during the day. Oh, really? Because I assume they're in relationships. And yeah, they, that's they can obvious. arrange not to be at work for a few hours. Right. I Dentist see. appointment. Yeah. I see. <laughs> Whereas, makes sense. But if they're not coming home at night, there yeah. starts or to be questions. Weekend, they may yeah. have commitments at home. You know? Yeah. Have you ever fallen for a client or developed feelings for a no. client? No. Oh, I think you. I distinguish that. I mean, I don't have uh, romantic feelings, but I do form genuine friendships. Mm -hmm. And in one or two cases, I've got quite close to people, various reasons over a number of years. You know, they might come to my social event at my house or vice versa. I might go to a social event at their house. Uh Uh-huh. Well, they, you guys know each other very intimately, yeah, so... It's it's... Yeah. And sometimes they'll introduce me as Miss Emily, and sometimes they won't introduce me by my other name. Is but the reason is... it hasn't gone beyond, like, friends, though, because you're in other relationships, or because it's, like, a line of being a client that you would never um, go past? No, it's not that. Primarily, it's that I'm not very attracted um, romantically to cis men. But have any of them fallen in love with you? Oh, def- I, I definitely um, think so. Oh, <laughs> I can see I'm that. Sure. I can see that for multiple sure. people. What do you think are some of the common misconceptions about what you do? I think there's a lot of misconceptions from completely outside the clients and the workers. You know, like a lot of people think that anybody who's a prostitute, for want a better word, is abused or a victim mm-hmm. or is controlled. Mm-hmm. And I know that does sometimes happen. It's a you big know. generalization. It's a huge generalization. And when you first started in the industry, what was the most surprising thing for you? 
personally. I don't think I was surprised really at all. I mean, prior to that, I've been in all these sex positive, BDSM positive communities. And some of the people in those communities are sex workers. Mm -hmm. So I already knew a whole bunch of sex workers. I think for me, the main thing was just feeling I felt very nervous that I wasn't going to do a good job. Mm. That was my main concern. Oh, like any <laughs> starting a new job. Perfectionist <laughs> that you are. It's not exactly a perfectionist, but I am definitely. Yeah, I starting, don't want... Imposter syndrome, starting a new yes, job. Exactly. You're like, am I right. going to meet yeah. up to the standards? And yeah. Partly because also in that community, prior to doing it professionally, I don't want to be very gender genderist here, but it's often guys <laughs> who just put on a lot of black leather and say, I'm a dom. Mm, right and i'm like well what qualifies you to do that show me your resume you know i get lots of hot chicks by being a dom you know Mm, (laughs) think again yeah Yeah. i have a uh i have a close friend in new york who used to be a pro dom and i she told me that her biggest surprise finding was that she didn't realize there were so many different types of pro doms she Mm -hmm. herself she is a big girl and she calls herself the big girl pro dom and her whole thing was (laughs) commanding the guys eat that was that was mm-hmm. basically it she would dress very sex- sexily and they would eat meet out at restaurants a lot of times mm-hmm. and she would make them eat and then mm-hmm. they would watch her eat and that was yeah. her niche and so she said there's a lot of different interests there are, out there that's true were they turned on sexually by that yes. interesting yeah. oh yeah i think it's not exactly a surprise, but the major revelation for me. I mean, you can think about this in an abstract sense. You know, on the internet, you can think of the weirdest thing possible, but sure enough, there's, oh, a, there. there's a site and a whole bunch of people in the forum. But I was mildly surprised to discover people would come to see me and ask to do X. Yeah. You know, I'm not horrified by it, but I was like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing. Have you ever said no to something that was um, requested? I, I would only say no to things where I really, I'm not very good at it i know i'm not very good at it one example is humiliation where i think some doms do do humiliation but i actually went on a course which was taught by mistress maduri and Mm -hmm. it is very difficult to do well and it's very difficult to do without actually psychologically hurting people you know if you choose the wrong Mm -hmm. thing to humiliate somebody you can actually affect the core of who they are yeah and um so and i'm not very good at that Mm. what are other things like i mean like i wouldn't have thought about humiliation as something or eating like what are some other things that are out there (laughs) it's time to take a quick break so we can tell you about the latest service we have been building over here at dateable we've created a platform to connect you with vetted experts from our network to help with everything from coaching with dating therapy dating profile reviews and even ways to get real feedback about your dating style the sessions typically run from 30 minutes to an hour and can all be done via skype or google hangouts so you can be anywhere Listeners have been sharing how worthwhile their sessions have been with comments about how easy the coaches are to talk to, how they have provided a new perspective, and how they have created actionable ways to inspire change. To meet the coaches and book your session today, visit datablepodcast.com slash coaching. Now back to the show. What are some other things that are out there? <laughs> I heard, I mean, I are we allowed to just say anything? Everything? Yeah. <laughs> anything. Give it to us. Some clients are very much into toilet play of one sort or another. And let's explore that a little bit more. Mm. Golden showers. Yes. Um, what else? It's not that common, but some clients like poop. When when you poop on them or yes. they poop on you? When oh, you poop on them. They're not either on one. me. Oh, right. <laughs> Remember, not I'm, at my service. <laughs> I'm, I'm the dumb here. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm, again, thinking back to the story of the first pro dom I met, she said one of the most requested services was she would be on top of a glass table and her clients would be underneath uh-huh. and they would watch her right. pee and poop. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't even end in sex but they were extremely turned on by it what other ones well i mean one of the ones i particularly enjoy is some of my clients are very much into multiple doms so i have friends and or colleagues who have clients maybe it's my client who would like another dom to join them join us or vice versa and i i just enjoy that immensely you know two of us powerful women (laughs) ordering this little slave around and having fun (laughs) with the slave Oh my goodness. Talk <laughs> about co-working there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's much more fun because you are actually working with someone. Yeah. You, yeah. Get, you get a kind of sparks flying, you know. 
It's oh, a lot of fun. fun. Let's do one more example. Okay. <laughs> Another one. This is so good. Oh, I have to think of one. Um, this is one which, again, is not very frequent, but I do have a couple of clients. Actually, both of them are visiting from other parts of the US. So I, don't, I see them infrequently mm -hmm. who are into extreme fisting. Mm. What's extreme fisting? Well, more than one. Oh, wow. Oh. And obviously you have to work up to that rather gradually yeah. and gently. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of them arrives with elbow length gloves for me and a big bucket of Crisco. Oh, wow. And we get them nicely tied oh, down wow. and we get to work. That seems like a lot of manual labor involved in that one too. <laughs> You're working yeah, out at the same time. My hands are a little bit bigger than some. <laughs> Is it is it ever non-sexual things that you're like, go get me this or go get me a coffee? <laughs> I had so much luck with that. I have um, I do know one or two doms who have like house slaves. And in some cases, one of my slaves went to New York and was a house slave in a very well established dominatrix's household. She's known as the Baroness. Oh wow. And he was in her household for six months and According to him, when he came back, never had sex with the Baroness. He was low in the totem pole in our household. He was mostly cleaning and... You oh, know. my gosh. So he's like the yeah. maid. That just reminds me. Okay, again, my friend who... This, is in, this happened in New York. My friend in New York was a fitness instructor. Mm -hmm. Had this guy who was in her class and he said... I just want to pay you money to talk shit to me. Mm -hmm. Tell me how horrible I am. Tell me I'm ugly. Tell me I'm poor. All that. So this one time, she picked me up at my house. He was driving. And she said, don't ask any questions. Just get in. So I was in this car with like six of her girlfriends. Mm -hmm. And she's in the passenger seat just yelling at him. <laughs> Turn left here. What the fuck are you thinking? Turn right here. I, I, and, I admire her performance skills. Oh man, she was she I'm was not turning sure I could it do up. that with a straight face. Yeah. <laughs> and then he took us to Red Lobster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> paid for everything. Paid for everything, but he stayed in the car. She made sure yeah. that he stayed in the car and that he drove us all home. Ah. And never ended in sex or anything. Right. But she continued this relationship for about so two years. What I do you would quite like to find people like that? That would be great, right? <laughs> I ask you, like, what is it? Do you think that he is like getting satisfaction by? Well, apparently he was some sort of high school football coach. And he was so traumatized from his experience doing that, that now he likes the roles to be reversed. I, I don't know. I'm not. I think there is some psychology of people who really want to be of service. They right. are extreme givers and they get enormous pleasure from you know, worshipping a mistress and mm -hmm. providing the mistress with everything she might possibly require. Mm. And Emily, for you, in addition to the financial benefits, mm -hmm. what are some of the psychological benefits for you? Well, I get to do lots of fun things that I have always been doing uh -huh. <laughs> and sometimes it's really really hot and I have a great time and I'm getting paid <laughs> right which is the best <laughs> so do, best way. does your family or like friends know about this um most of my friends here know about it yeah okay yeah. and family family no would you ever tell them not really no I okay. mean they're a little bit older quite traditional and I think they might struggle to understand so what do you tell them that you do for work I just tell him I'm, I'm in between jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Freelancing. Yeah. Contracting. Contracting. Yeah. There you go. Contracting. Technically not a lie. Yeah. So. At all. What are some of the changes that you've seen this industry go through? Well, when I talked to people who were in the industry, say, 20 plus years ago, mm -hmm. they said it was, in some respects, it was much harder because finding clients was tricky. So the internet made a huge change. And particularly, the internet made a huge change for people, at, if you like, the low end of the industry. Mm -hmm. People who might be working the streets, they could find clients on the web, rent a hotel room. Um, if anything, now that has changed, it's changing back. There's been a series of governmental laws passed which are really trying to stop the sex industry. I mean, it's ludicrous. It's mm -hmm. never going to stop. Websites are being closed by the FBI and or voluntarily because they're worried about falling afoul of legislation. One particular set of bills called Festa Sosta, Sosta which went through in March, mm -hmm. which make it, it's allegedly to remove uh, an exclusion under the Communications Decency Act, which allows in its internet platforms not to be responsible for content that they post. So it meant that we could all put stuff on the internet saying, 
like, hey, I'm a sex worker. This is where you can find me. Sesta Foster made it an offense to do that and or facilitate prostitution. What we've seen is like all the advertising sites closed down and or went offshore. And that meant a lot of people who'd been advertising on Backpage or Craigslist perhaps didn't have the resources or the money to advertise offshore. They went back onto the streets, which is a much more dangerous place to be. Much more dangerous. So what are some ways the community is fighting back? Well, we're trying, there's various lawsuits Mm. that are being raised against that particular legislation, which actually I heard fell at the first hurdle, but they can appeal upwards. There are various uh, sex worker activist groups who are trying to lobby in state and or federal legislation, Mm. uh, legislators. And with another hat on, I'm a member of a group who run a a court case, which has been working its way up through the federal court system, which essentially declares or challenges California's prostitution law Mm -hmm. as being unconstitutional, as an infringement on sexual privacy. We, you know, as as an industry, as a set of activists, we have very few resources. Yeah, it's sort of, there's some parallels with the cannabis industry, right? Mm -hmm. There's still stigmatized, Mm -hmm. but there's huge demand for it. Yeah. So people are either hiding behind closed doors, supporting it, or they should be Mm -hmm. out there fighting for it. Yeah. You know, your first instinct is to hide. Right. You know, and right. it takes a lot of guts to walk down the middle of market with a big sign saying, you know, sex worker rights are human rights. Right. How do you think this industry will look like in, let's say, 20 years? Let's use our imagination. I mean, there's an optimistic part of me, which is that society might get over its like terrible moral disapproval of everything and might start thinking, well, it's consenting adults having sex as it happens for money in private. So what's the big deal? I mean, it took the US, as an example, up until 2003 to say that it was okay for gay men. So I'm not holding my breath. I mean, there are examples. There's one shining example. New Zealand. Mm. New Zealand decriminalized. It became a not, no longer a criminal offense. It wasn't legalized where you have to have permits and all this stuff. It was decriminalized in 2003. Mm. And they've had several royal commissions since, which have concluded that on balance, it was a good thing. There was certainly no bad effects. There was no real change in the level of prostitution. But the workers now had much better relationships with police, mm. which is usually the people we suffer most yes, from. Right. Cops love to harass sex workers. Police actually, mm. therefore, were freed up to go after the bad guys. Well, when I think about 20 years from now, and like you said earlier, the sex industry is always going to be there, yes. no matter what they do with websites and shutting mm-hmm. down this and that. So I'm just thinking about the ease of technology, what that could mean. And I can see an industry where people will pay for virtual reality oh, dom, that, that dom services. Kind of exists. There are 3D VR mm, websites yeah. which offer sex, not so much pro-dom, but sex. Do you think you would get the same effect from that, though? Just... Well, you'd be surprised with technology, because yeah. with haptic yeah. technology, yeah. you could feel a lot of touch it. Yeah, and yeah. interesting. And, and you know, anything. It feels so far off for me. I know, but... I know. But Robots. I know. <laughs> Actually, no, right oh, now, <laughs> there is this Canadian company who want to open a robot brothel in oh. Houston. Oh my god. In Houston. I don't know why Houston. Yeah, that's just, <laughs> you are kidding. Me. Really? It just feels like so not sexy at well, all. But, but, but there's to each their to own. You. Yeah. I'm kind of guessing you're not the typical typical buyer. Probably not. <laughs> you're but not in their demographic. Bro- I don't know how a robot just seems so like sterile. <laughs> they should open that <laughs> yes. in Japan. They'd be all that's over that. True. There Japan they would, would love be it. All they over would that. love it. Yeah. A robot and I think that you're right in one way is that uh, if you look at the evolution of the internet, pretty much Every new part of the internet technology was driven or first exploited by. Yeah, you know, at porn. one point they said, mm. I don't know, 25% of all streaming video was porn. Yep. Yeah. It's probably been overtaken by cat videos now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now live streaming is so huge. Yeah. And it's actually just a way for a mm. lot of sex workers to promote Absolutely. their services. Yeah. And or there's a whole industry of cam workers. Mm, People yeah. who never actually have physical contact. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm a little bit behind the curve. I'm going to start offering online services. Oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah, well, yeah well, diversify. Like, especially depending on what you're looking for. If you just want, if you're like that guy that just wants to get bossed around, yeah. like maybe you could insult and them via the internet. Yeah. <laughs> it's generally a, a cheaper point of entry. Yeah. Right? If you sign up, I don't know the precise rates, but I get the impression oh, yeah. 
15 minutes of cam, which is usually enough for most guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's being it generous. It might only cost you 50 bucks, whereas yeah. an hour session is, you know, a lot more money. And there's yeah. something about, like, being in your home. Very so that's a big, big part of the industry now, particularly among younger workers. So you just need a laptop and a camera. Yeah, that's it. And there you are. No, and so a nice crazy. light. How much you can do <laughs> just with a laptop and a camera. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to some takeaways from this conversation with Ms. Emily. I think for me, this idea of feedback is always very compelling Mm -hmm. because for a lot of people who are dating, they never ask for the feedback, especially when it comes to sex, because people are so shy to talk Mm -hmm. about it, that you don't know what your partner wants and what they like. Mm -hmm. And you actually don't know how to ask for the things that you are interested in. Mm -hmm. So I like your tactic of starting somewhere giving them something tangible for them to react to versus just saying flat out, what do you like? Right. But I think also to piggyback off that, consent does not have a start and end time. Absolutely. So if you're doing something and Mm -hmm. you change your mind by all means, like that is fair game. And that applies in the dating world. You know, you Mm -hmm. you meet someone who seems pretty hot, but then for whatever reason, it's not going so great. And maybe you did give consent. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. Let's try this. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, actually, it's not going for me. You can withdraw consent at any Mm -hmm. moment. Right. So it's being open to trying new things, but Mm -hmm. not feeling that if you like commit to something, you're stuck there either. If you end up realizing like, oh, this actually isn't for me. Like you were saying, some clients, I mean, there's most of them come back, but there are some that don't. And that's, yeah. It didn't work with them for whatever reason it might be. Yep. So my other kind of takeaway from this whole conversation is I just like love having these conversations because I think in media, there's a certain portrayal. I think hearing from someone that's in the actual, like having the experience is so like powerful. And we've had so many people on the show say that hearing from people um, that were outside of kind of what they traditionally Mm -hmm. thought about dating and sex and all sorts of things help them just open up their minds. So I just think in general, sex is an evolving conversation and people feel like they need to be bucketed to, oh, I'm into normal sex. I'm into, you know, the non kinky sex or some people are like, I'm only into kinky sex. I feel like sexual preferences evolve with who you are as a person mm-hmm. too. So I, I don't think we need to stay static in our yeah. sexual interests. I think they can also be very situational. Mm. You know, some of my relationships are what you might consider vanilla. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just nice, loving relationships. Mm-hmm. And others are what you might consider kinky. This isn't being a pro-dom. It's playing or expressing a part of myself. Uh, but it's only a part. That's an mm. interesting point, too, because I feel like you could also apply that even in just the most monogamous of relationships. Mm-hmm. Like you could be one way with mm-hmm. one partner and then another way with a different partner. Mm-hmm. And some of that might just be you evolving, but it mm-hmm. could just be different sides of you I'm as sure well. you probably had people on here who are poly. Yep. Oh, yeah. Who say, you know, if, uh, with partner A, they express you know, some part of themselves, mm. but they don't feel constrained because they get express a different part, a different flavor of themselves with another mm. partner and they feel much more fulfilled. Right. And I'm kind of like that with sex too. You come home after a hard day at the office <laughs> and it's like, hey honey, you know, I made dinner and after dinner, how about... Yeah. It's like, you know, I'm whacked. <laughs> <laughs> How about some vlogging? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's right. also on the flip side, a good takeaway though for people is just because someone did something once. Oh, yeah. Doesn't mean that they want to do yeah. it every single time yeah. or it's. I mean, there again, people are different. Some people I see, they want to do precisely the same thing mm. every time I see them. That's really? their thing. And that's fine because I know where I am. It's great. Yep. And then other people, they're open to exploring. So I can oh. I can bring them along. Oh, you know, interesting. Over a period of time, you know, to the point where somebody claims they're very, very shy. They couldn't mm-hmm. possibly do X. Here they are a year or two later doing X. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting situation just even like with one partner mm-hmm. of like, yeah. understanding who they are sexually and maybe it's some of it's through observation but then also having like a way that they can open up mm-hmm. to you and i think that's why i'm so intrigued by these play parties because that is an opportunity for you to play with mm-hmm. multiple partners and see yeah. what are some other ways you can find pleasure mm-hmm. a lot of times we can't verbalize what makes us feel good mm-hmm. but at least we can imagine oh, okay when this person did this to me 
that's how I felt. I actually, lately, I'm mentoring other people who are expressing an interest in not just being a pro-dom, but expressing Mm -hmm. that side of themselves. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've been doing a lot is going to public play parties, like at the Citadel, for example, Mm. which is just around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Uh And what I suggest to them is we go to the Citadel, we get all dressed up. (laughs) <laughs> obviously we feel sexy and fine you know of course but i say for the first time i would recommend that i just watch just be a voyeur yep. yeah that was exactly the advice we got when we went mm-hmm. to a play party mm-hmm. yeah or- and then you can say oh that looks kind of interesting or perhaps you might say you know none of this is that interesting right not for me but not at least you me. know because yeah. you opened up and yeah. was yeah open to it here's a realistic question for you how sustainable do you think this is this, this uh, sex, the sex industry and being a pro dom. Do you think you can, can you see yourself doing this for the next decade or 20 years? Perhaps. I do see some people in the industry, they get in, they do five years of pretty hard work. Mm-hmm. And if they're sensible, they squirrel a lot of money away. Mm-hmm. And then they go on to be a lawyer or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I also know people who've been in the industry for 20, 30 years because it really suits their way of work. You know, they may have kids who mm. they put through school. Mm. I see a lot of transferable skills to being great managers. Mm. <laughs> I mean, pro doms would be your best managers at a company. Maybe. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I think. I don't know about that, actually. <laughs> my, my experience in a more straightforward professional environment is that being commanding often has bad results. Yeah, you need to be a little more, cl- like there's a line a of dominance there. Yeah, you can lead, but you can't tell. But you're asking for feedback along the way. Yeah. It's not a dictator, yeah. shit. you're yeah. not a dom. <laughs> On feedback, one thing that I, my mentor strongly suggested was that at the end of every session, we do five minutes at the end mm. to just sit down, help them come down from the... Oh, high as like a were. cool down a cool down but also just to maybe cuddle them a little bit oh, ask how yeah. it was you know because it can be a, a big thing to go from yep. this very intense and for many people are pushing their boundaries or it's a huge fantasy for them and it's very exciting mm-hmm. and then they've got to go and get in their car and drive home yeah, yeah. and it's still yeah. right outside i can yeah. see that <laughs> yeah but i don't often do ask them for feedback i ask them how was that i leave it very open-ended because yep. a lot of them don't like to be put on the spot. Mm, I can see that. They're still processing, you know. Yeah, right, or right. it doesn't come to you right then. Yeah. Right. So I guess just like as a wrap up, like mm-hmm. is there any parting advice you would either give to anyone interested in exploring? Other than the mentors mm-hmm. that you talked mm-hmm. about before and finding, doing your research and due diligence. If you're talking specifically about someone interested interested in being a dom i think the key thing is to find your inner voice some people have it and i discovered i did you know i can just somehow talk i don't have to talk loud but i can talk a certain way which is in charge not everybody has that or they have it in different ways so you have to find who you are who your voice is some people i know who do sex work who do girlfriend experience oh yeah right and they genuinely form an emotional connection for that one hour. Mm-hmm. They are really girlfriends for that one hour. Yeah, They can do that, whereas not everybody can. Awesome. Do you want to say your website one more time? Right. It's, uh, I'll spell it. It's M-S-E-M-I-L-I-E-O-X-F-O-R-D dot com. Awesome. And like you, I said, we'll link it in the Thank show you. notes Ms. as well. Miss Emily Oxford. And also, we want to hear more from sex workers. We were trying to get Jeremy Long on our show, the Asian porn star, but apparently he recently cut off his pinky and has <gasps> um, removed himself from the industry and does not oh, want damn. to take any more interviews Aww. due to a really tragic accident that happened. So... Anybody else, we love to talk to porn stars, anybody else in the sex industry, we want to hear from you because I think it's always good for us to, you know, open up this conversation and hear from you, the actual people who we want to learn about as opposed to trying to uh, make assumptions that are, they're not rooted in anything. And lastly, of course, we want to hear from you in general. You don't have to be a sex worker to be on our (laughs) show. So if you'd like to be a guest, go to datablepodcast.com. On that note, we're going to wrap this up. Stay Stay dateable. Your action item for this week is to practice getting feedback. Start with your friends and your family, with your coworkers. 
and then someday maybe ask for feedback after sex or in sexual situations. This episode of Dateable is brought to you by 500 Brunches. 500 Brunches connects like-minded people with similar interests to meet in real life over brunch. You answer a quick questionnaire about your interests and how you spend your time, and then they'll match you in small groups of six to eight at a brunch spot in San Francisco. Get a free entry into a brunch now by signing up at 500brunches.com and using the code DATEABLE. If you didn't know already, we have a revamped website with articles, videos, and content all about modern dating. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We've had some great feedback about how actionable these episodes are. So check them out on our website or iTunes Music. Also, visit the site today to see the latest about coaching, where we connect you with dateable approved experts to help with everything from dating profile reviews, coaching, and even gathering real feedback about your dating style in a personalized and affordable way. To connect with us, visit datablepodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all under Dateable Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and auto-download the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast player so you never miss an episode. 